Let's do some fan questions. Hey, Joe, quick question. Um, I don't know if you saw recently, but uh, Israel Adesanya actually just did Joe Rogan's podcast. Uh, it uploaded tonight, and uh, I was just watching it, and I heard uh, Izzy say that he was walking around at 203 right now. Uh, granted, that is him, you know, eating our American food and, you know, putting on a couple extra pounds. But I was just wondering, uh, now that we know that he, you know, walks around at about at about 200, does a fight with John Jones seem more feasible now? Because I remember uh, you had talked about how he came in underweight for a couple of his fights and how it may be easier for him to get to 170 versus uh, 205, light heavyweight. Yeah, I, I'm right. Izzy's wrong. He's lying. You're asking me if I'm understanding. Are we closer to getting Israel Adesanya versus John Jones? Yes. We're, we're close enough to getting it to the point that Adesanya is now lying about what he weighs because he wants to fight John Jones so bad. So if you're asking, <laughs> okay, you have to understand, Adesanya wants that fight. John Jones, I assume, needs that fight and realizes it and would take it too. Adesanya does not weigh 203 pounds. Adesanya has never weighed 203 pounds. And when I tell you that he would have an easier time getting to 170, actually making it, actually weighing 170, then weighing 205. I understand he could make the weight class, meaning he comes in less than 205. I'm telling you, he could eat all he wants. He will not weigh 205. But if you're asking me if he'll take the fight against John Jones at 205 and tell everybody that he's big enough to do it, yes. That's a credit to what a crazy competitor this guy is, to how tough he is and how fearless he is. But if you're asking me who's right, me or Adesanya, about what Adesanya, I'm telling you the truth. He does not weigh 203 pounds. So if Joe Rogan knows how to fight, why hasn't he? <laughs> That's it? Okay. You got right to the point on that. Let me answer. Uh... First off, Joe has never been a fake tough guy, and I have heard people tease him for that. Joe has been a guy, don't forget this, who loves the sport, particularly jiu-jitsu, and his personal relationship and his history with Eddie Bravo, but it was particularly jiu-jitsu. Now, he grew up doing taekwondo, and it turned out he was really good at taekwondo. But his love was jujitsu, which then transformed, much like my love of wrestling, into mixed martial arts. But Joe largely was able to turn to his experience in jujitsu through his past in taekwondo to just having a better understanding of not only the techniques that are being employed, not only the footwork and the strategies, but also a lot of the psychological makeup that it takes to go into those kind of competitions. Joe has never pretended, I've heard a couple of people kind of push back about, hey, if you're so good, why don't you do it? Joe's never played Mr. Tough Guy, but it is appropriate and fair that he would reference the fact of, hey, I've actually done this. I've been in some of these positions. I can share with you some of the escapes, but I can also share with you some of the mindset that's going through as fatigue and stress and an opponent standing across from you sets in. I think that's very above board. I think that also gives Joe a tremendous uh, leg up in his job of calling a fight and knowing what it is he's looking at, I will share with you the only time that things ever got weird is when Joe had called out Wesley Snipes. But there was also a place for that. Wesley Snipes had taken his shots back at Joe and acted like he wanted to fight. So Joe said, okay, great. I don't know that you're particularly great at this, but you have a martial arts background. I'm not proclaiming I'm particularly great at this, but I have a background. You can't get this fight done. I'm going to see Dana White later tonight. I can. Wesley, you want to fight? Let's fight. That was all the way back in 2005. And I thought it was above board when Joe did it. I was on his side of that. I would have liked to have seen the fight. Hello, Chael. Um, hopefully you get this and you answer my question because I've tried like six times. But no hard feelings. I am going to have to disagree, buddy. I think uh, Zabit is not going to go for the title next. I don't think he's ready. I think him and Yarir Rodriguez would be a, an amazing match, and that should be the next fight for him. What do you think? Did you say Yarir? It's Yair, idiot. What's up, Uncle Chael? 
Every time we talk about hypothetical matchups, we talk about Tony versus Khabib, Connor versus Khabib too, but nobody ever talks about Gaethje versus Tony. I'm just curious your thoughts on how that would go. Well, now there's a wild one, right? And that's probably uh, very realistically in the foreseeable future. I could see those guys getting matched up. That is an interesting one because the one thing you have to deal with with Gaethje is you have to deal with a toughness and a pace. And those are things that you, you can't learn that in the room. Your coach can't sit you down, much like, you know, taking a hook and showing you how to block it or parrying a right hand or, or, or dealing with a kick. It's not something anybody can teach you. You've either got that or you don't. You either have that within you to match that toughness and match that pace, or you don't. And aside from Poirier and Alvarez, I mean, there's not a lot of guys that can deal with the, you know, what Justin Gaethje brings to the table. Great. Good for him. The reason that pertains to the answer to Tony, that's the same thing that Tony brings to the table, right? Tony's got a toughness and he's got a pace. So eventually, if that washes out, now you are going to turn to skill. And when you start to get into skill, that's where Tony really thrives. We just don't see it a whole lot. The great fighters will always go in order. Plan A to plan B and plan C only if I need it. Plan C only if A and B didn't work. Tony's one of these guys that can outgrit, out tough, and outpace everybody. So he never really has to show the world just how goddamn good he is. I mean, in truth, he doesn't. If you guys saw Tony in the practice, you would see skills of a whole nother level. But you're going to have to wait for four and five and six rounds of sparring into it because just like in fights, he relies on that pace and that toughness first. So just how good is Tony? I think Justin Gaethje would bring it out of him. I don't think Justin Gaethje is going to wilt or go anywhere. He never has against anybody else. So when you start to talk about that match, and particularly the championships on the line, now all of a sudden you got a five round contest between these. I mean, you've got a really something special there. And if you're asking me to give you a prediction for who's going to win, look, I think both of those guys have the right to the claim to be in championship fights. It sounds as though Tony's going to get the nod first, but Justin's just behind him. So I don't think a prediction would be appropriate as much as a tip of the hat for you for recognizing that that's coming down the tracks. Hey, Chael, why is nobody talking about Vasil Lomachenko coming to MMA? I mean, he's posted videos of doing Muay Thai. He's the pound for pound number one boxer, in my opinion. But he spent his childhood doing Sambo and Greco-Roman. It seems like he has all the skills. Why is he not coming over? Is it the money or what do you think? So, okay, I don't think Lomachenko's coming. Look, I, he's a prize fighter. And I think it's just sim as simple as dollars and cents. And I don't know that he would have that big mega fight if he came over to MMA. I mean, let me ask you, who's he going to fight? And you can answer the question. You go, put him in there with uh, TJ Dillashaw. Put him in there with Henry Cejudo. I know you could answer the question. What I'm asking you is, can he make $10 million doing it? Can he fill up an arena doing it? Is there a story to sell with the right opponent where that works? Maybe the answer is, you know, the answer is no. It's just not. So he can stay over in boxing and do what he's good. Great. Look, I think what you're saying is that he would do very well in MMA, at least for boxers that we see, that he does have a background, that he does go into MMA gyms, that he does work out, that he does have a reputation as a legitimate guy that could come over to MMA. I don't disagree with any of that. And if that's what you're attempting to point out, with me, you've succeeded. I've seen sparring footage between him and TJ Dillashaw. Now, it was boxing. They were in his world. But... All the same, he was an open-minded guy. And yes, he does have that grappling background. And I don't know how much of that is embellished or how much of it is real, but I choose to be in your side of this that I believe it. And he's certainly an athlete and he's certainly young enough and fast enough and all these different things. But I don't know that he's at a point of his life where he has to come over and do something that isn't his bread and butter just to prove that he can. And don't forget, guys, if he does come over... It is to fight a Henry Cejudo. It is to fight a TJ Dillashaw. He's not coming over to fight the number eight guy. Coming over to fight some guy debuting just to say I walked out there and did. That's not what it's about. That's just what it makes sense. What's he going to get for that? I mean, not for nothing. But look, he's an entertainer. He puts on a show. But he's expecting a jackpot at the end of the night. He's in a position where he can command that and bring it in. I don't think he needs to put himself in a position to come out and bang his chest and say, look how good I am. 
at this other discipline that I've never done before. Hey, Uncle Chill. How are you doing, brother? I'm a big fan of your show. And well, look, two years ago, we got this Jorge Masvidal against Wonderboy Thompson fight that many people might not remember. But Wonderboy Thompson took that fight. He decisively won against um, Jorge Masvidal. And then after that, we saw what happened when Anthony Pettis faced Wonderboy Thompson. He knocked him out. Then we had the Nate Diaz-Anthony Pettis fight in which Diaz dominated Pettis. Then two weeks ago, we had the Jorge Masvidal-Nate Diaz fight in which Jorge Masvidal dominated Nate Diaz. And look, these chains happen very often in MMA, you know, in which one guy beats this guy and then the guy he lost to beat him, you know. It happens. I'm not surprised about any of that. But look, we had this impressive performance of Wonderboy Thompson against Vicente Luque. And then we have this new Jorge Masvidal who's a monster. So I want to ask you, Cho, what do you think would happen if they fought today? Well, I like where your head's at there. I mean, let me unpack this. You, you actually, that wasn't the easiest question to follow, even though I think you said it very well. So I want to make sure that I did hear that correctly, which is you're asking what would happen if Wonder Boy fought Masvidal today. Am I right? Okay. That's what I'm going to answer. So I'm hoping I got you right, but... Let's think about that for just a second, because there is something to be said for momentum, isn't there? Which is now on both of their sides. Perhaps nobody in the sport more than Masvidal. But Wonder Boy did have a very interesting uh, last fight as well. I mean, not only did he go out and perform, he performed after coming off a knockout, which many guys, particularly in the boxing world, but many guys in MMA as well, all of a sudden they're gun shy. All of a sudden, they don't want to engage. All of a sudden, it wrecks them, and it changes them, and it messes with their psychology, which then affects their physiology. Wonder Boy didn't do that. Wonder Boy was put to the test, and boy, did he ever pass it. One thing about Wonder Boy that I don't think he gets enough credit for, his opponents see it, but I'm not sure the fans do, is his pace. And Wonder Boy is known for keeping space, kind of like Machida does, and so it's a little hard for the fan to see just how busy and how aggressive and how active he's been until you're in the ring with him. Wonder Boy will never stop trying to hit you. He'll never stop trying to kick you. And even though it's not a straightforward pressure like use a Justin Gaethje or a Khabib or a Tony Ferguson, guys, that it's very visible and you can see that pace. His is harder to see, but it's still there. And I will acknowledge for you, Wonder Boy versus Masvidal was an interesting fight. And while Masvidal might have stuck him, Wonder Boy was getting his licks in before that happened. So I see what you're seeing. I hear what you're saying. I saw what you saw, but I must also tell you in the world of promotion, I don't need to see that fight again. And that's not a knock on George or a knock on Wonder Boy. I don't need to see that fight again. George is in a unique position right now. I mean, he is a unicorn in the sport. He is one guy in the sport. And there's only about three guys. I would put Connor in there. And I'm going to put Diaz brothers as one. I'm The Diaz boys, Connor, and now Masvidal, that can do anything they want and fill up any arena that Dana plays. And they could do it in a main event spot. And no belt has to be on the line. It's a very unique thing. And I hope George goes and runs with it in any which direction. Something tells me he's not. Something tells me that crazy bastard's going to go right into a world title fight just because that's who he is. I'm not sure Masvidal realizes where he's at. I'm not sure he does. And Wonder Boy, on the other hand, I think he's also got a lot of options. And Wonder Boy's not the guy that you want to fight. Once you fight him once because somebody called and said that this is what this is the job I have for you, whoo, done. Win, lose, or draw, done. I checked it. Call somebody else, boss. Me and a buddy of mine were having a debate, and bit quick bit of context here. Uh, the debate was about the usage of any kind of performance-enhancing substance in just a personal life. So outside of an athletic, you know, scenario or com competition of any kind, just people using them who want to, like, say, increase their stamina, their muscle mass, you know, their abilities, but have no interest in, like, competing. We ultimately came to the realization that we don't really have a frame of reference to this or a dog in this race. Neither of us have experimented, so we're kind of just uh, talking semantics here. You've been very candid about, you know, your knowledge in that and having been in that world. So from what you know and from, you know, your experience, would you say any kind of performance enhancing uh, anything 
is something you would recommend to people who are just, you know, just regular folks in their regular lives? Do the benefits outweigh the cons? All right, I must say, I can't answer your question head on without giving a little bit of an explanation. So here's what happened. Don't forget the term performance enhancing. Those are positive words. Performance enhancing, that's positive. What we teach kids in school, what you want to keep children off of, is something that will de-hance you, something that will alter your state of mind, ultimately impair you, possibly kill you. When we're talking about performance enhancing, those are good terms. To use as an example, no doctor can give you anything that does not enhance performance. If he did, that would be called malpractice. Imagine going to your doctor and saying, hey, doc, I feel great. Do you got anything that could bring me down a little bit? Right? I mean, if you want to be FDA approved, the very first thing that you must prove to the United States Congress is that you can help, that you can enhance somebody. I always have to bring that up because when I was growing up, it was always steroid. The word performance enhancer, what are they called? PEDS, PED, that was not a term. I had never heard it. When I got all the way through high school and I got into the NCAA Division I, they made us take classes as scholarship athletes. But again, it was about steroids only. Somewhere over time, the term performance enhancing came out. That's a little bit of a weird one because what you're asking me is should a person outside of sport be looking at medications to enhance their performance? That's what your words were of which the answer would obviously be speak with your doctor and go from there. Don't listen to shit. Go speak with your doctor and go from there. If your doctor gives you something, it's a performance enhancer. What I believe you're asking me though, opposite of your words, what I believe you're asking me is should a person be taking steroids? That's what I think you're meaning by this. And no, there again, I would simply t go talk with your doctor. There is some steroids out there, by example, testosterone, which is an anabolic. Some people don't like to say testosterone is a steroid because steroid has a stigma of illegal. While testosterone is an appropriate, is technically an anabolic. For women, doctors are into something known as estrogen when you're talking about anti-aging and for ladies over a certain age. But there again, go and talk to your doctor. See what they have to say. I would only correct one term which is while athletes have given PEDS a terrible name, you're going to have a hard time meeting a doctor that tells you something bad about it. A doctor would tell you, look, this is good science and this is good medicine. Let's do the test and let's see if this is helpful for you. Athletes that use it when it's against a rule, now it's dirty and it's cheating and therefore it gets a bad rap, which is fair. I'm just explaining the difference uh, between the question you asked, which is about performance enhancers, and what I think you meant to ask, which is about steroids. Uncle Jill, Uncle Jill, there's no